It was certainly him. Five people had been president since Valentine, and he had to be more than 80 years old. I was surprised to see him alive at all, much less clearly in good health. He looked much, much younger. His hair's still perfect. I was surprised too, but it's a wig. He's kept the wrinkles at bay with Botox and plastic surgery, apparently. But that doesn't matter. A former president is telling us this will happen. We have to believe him, right? Right, he'd taken the picture as proof. But why is Valentine here in person? On an SDF helicopter? Putting himself in danger? You'd think he could just talk to the funniest directly. This is where it gets stupid. Alright guys, this is the moment. The funniest Valentine was the first person in history to be named D, and was the current president of the United States. He was Funny's grandson. Funny's son had been named Funnier Valentine, and he'd named his son the Funniest Valentine. Funny was an astronaut, still in active service at the age of 50. He'd been on the news a lot recently, since he was the pilot for the first ever manned flight to Mars. <coughs> I wasn't sure what was going on with the Valentines, but if the funniest plan to attack Morio wasn't Funny's action a betrayal? I looked up. Whoa, I said. Funny's still up there. Funny Valentine was having trouble getting back on the helicopter. I could still see him standing up there. <sighs> He'll be fine, Rohan said, pointing at the corner of the picture on Hirose's phone. I looked closer and could just make out what looked like a frog man. Small, transparent, standing on two legs. He's got a stand, Rohan said. Okay, sure, if he's got a stand, he'll be fine, we all nodded. Then shuddered as the implications of that dawned on us. The former president of the United States was a stand master, and stands were genetic, so the current president probably was too. Ah! Fukushigi said. So I looked up again. Funny Valentine had just been knocked off the dome ceiling, and was rocketing away when he suddenly stopped in mid-air, no rope or anything. Then he began zigzagging through the air up to the helicopter and vanished inside. Man, I hope the SDF people are okay, Hirel said. Hopefully seeing a stand in action won't lead to them being silenced. I doubt the risk would be worth it, Rohan said. The helicopter pilot's a soldier. Anything happens to him, it'll make waves. I'm sure Valentine's got an excuse in mind. It was all for pretty quick, and their soldiers have no way of understanding what happened. The helicopter flew away. In the distance we heard a loudspeaker. This is a message from the Morial Council. In two hours at 6pm there will be an emergency meeting. All citizens should gather at the Budogolka Gymnasium. This is a message from the Morial Council. A council van with a loudspeaker attached was slowly winding its way towards the harbour. If they were gathering citizens for an emergency meeting, Mayor Shishimura Denta would be there too. At Budogolka High School. That's where we thought the man moving Morio was. Where Kira Yoshikage was. Everyone's pointing to the same place, Rohan said. We should go. There's nothing we can do here but watch my house beat up Fukushigi. Shut up! Will you be okay alone, Sugimoto? Remy smiled. Thank you, but I'll be fine. Sorry. Being a stand, I can't leave this place. We'll go find Kira, take him down and be back before you know it. I didn't think it would be that easy, and Sugimoto looked like she agreed, but all she said was, I'll be waiting. Try not to do anything dangerous. I'll expect you back in one piece. She was a beautiful girl, and I was suddenly very jealous. How sweet! How sweet! You're a lucky man, Rohan! Not just the Nijimura brothers, Hiroz was making fun of Rohan too. Rohan turned bright red. Sh shut up! I was only being polite to my housemate. Come on! But something about the warm, fuzzy mood disturbed me. It didn't feel right, somehow. For no reason at all. But I felt like Rohan looked ready to cry. Uh, I'm not actually a standmaster or anything, so maybe I should stay here? I suggested. Rohan looked surprised. What are you talking about? You're the detective. You have to solve the case. You have to go after the killer. There's already been a murder here. The police have come and gone. You've arrived. Kira's bites the dust was listed. What else is there to do? It's time for a change of locale, surely. Things were pointing that way, but I couldn't explain why I found myself wanting to stay here. I've got a hunch, I said grimly. Sure, it's not just nerves. Stand battles do get rather physical. They are dangerous. But we'll do the fighting. You just work your mind. Seems like you're a real detective. 
I'm sure you can find Kira for us. I mean, he turned me into a bomb, and I still have no idea who he is. Egg on my face, as the saying goes. I'm not proud of that, but I won't let it get me down. I'm fighting back, Jellstar. When he put it like that, I had to go. You're a man, ain't you? Mirio Taisu chimed in. I don't care if you're English or Japanese. You need to grow some balls. Kira Yoshikage is a scumbag who goes around murdering women. We can't let him live a lover's second. Stop mewling and let's get. Fukushiki and Hiroz were both staring at me, and even NYPD Blue was grinning and sticking his middle finger up. Damn it! Okay. Then Sugimoto, call me if... Oh, you can't. Uh, is there any way you can signal us? Yes. I can't stop the arrow across house when it's pointing any way but north, but I can make it spin. Then spin it if anything happens. Good. Let's go, Murio Taisu shouted, and summoned the Grand Blue Trio. We followed his lead and jumped on their backs. Right. Don't let go. Jacques, Enzo, Joanna, skydiving. Go, go, go. Those must be the dolphins' names. At Murio Taisu's cry, the three dolphins chirped and shot away like rockets. To my surprise, it was much gentler than physics would ordinarily allow. G and centrifugal forces were entirely ignorable. Despite our speed, I could barely even feel the wind on my face. Why I would normally have been unable to open my eyes and have felt the flesh of my face bending out of shape, I felt nothing. The dolphin swept down the hill and across the fields, just off the surface of the ground. I wasn't sure if this was just a trait of the species, but the dolphins bounded across the farmland, leaping and diving, laughing all the way. Settle down, Jacques! Don't let him wind you up, Enzo, Joanna. This isn't a game, Muriel Taisu yelled. What had taken 20 minutes by cab took two by dolphin. We were already passing Muriel Station. I thought someone was bound to see us. But Muriel Taisu led us down deserted alleys, past shuttered storefronts, and through tunnels without any traffic to speak of. This was his territory. Of course, with that van going around, it was likely a good portion of the population was heading for the school, I thought. But he rose who was riding the same dolphin as me, his arms around my waist, said, Something's wrong. When we crossed the tracks, I caught a glimpse of the main road, but there was nobody crossing. There was nobody in the roundabout by the station either. Are the roads so deserted we don't need to hide? Rohan and the Ninja Moors were also looking around, suspicious and worried. I guess they're all just super responsive and organised, Fukushiki said brightly. Reality check, shit for brains. NYPD Blue said, Look! He pointed at the temple. It was on fire. By the time we reached Jozenji, the temple had burned to the ground, and the fire was dying down. The main temple hall, the structure housing the bell, and the living quarters had all burned. We got off the dolphins and moved closer. Without even looking inside, we were already struck dumb. It was clear the fire had started inside. The walls and pillars that survived were burned on the inside only. But what really got to us was the pile of gas tanks outside the closed doors. The air smelled of oil and gasoline. But why? It seemed they had set themselves on fire. What little the fire had left of the walls and floor were covered in drawings of... Moths? Or butterflies? The drawings were done with charcoal. Wait. Looking closer, I could see blood and bits of flesh. Behind me, Hiroz and the Nijimuras turned and ran, retching. Outside, they heard the splat of their vomit on the ground. They drew these pictures while they were on fire, Rohan asked. But what were they drawing? It wasn't an ordinary moth or butterfly. It had two burly legs and a large head with eyes staring out at us. It was hideous and yet beautiful, Rohan said. I turned to look at him. What? That's what I thought, he protested. But that's not what my look meant. I'd felt the same thing. This beauty, Rohan said. Do you feel it? They all drew so many mothmen. These drawings appear to be some sort of chimera of humans and moths. Some mothmen seems apt. But why did they draw so many of them? There were more drawings of the mothman than there are people dead. Why? The word mothman was oddly terrifying and I was having trouble getting past it. Rohan kept talking. They were trying to get it right. But none of the drawings did him justice, so they had to try again, using ash and charred flesh from their own burning bodies. I stared at him in horror. I'm an artist, I can tell. I know what it feels like to fill every available white space, desperately trying to capture the image in your head. It was beauty they were after. Beauty, they sought. You remember what I told you earlier? 
Symmetry is the basis of man-made beauty. Oh, certainly the Mothman was symmetrical? My voice was hoarse. The stench of burned flesh was making me light-headed. Indeed, Rohan said cheerily. With their muscles burning, they couldn't stop their hands shaking. But each of them sought the same for beauty. In a sense, this is a miracle. A terrifying one, but no less impressive. In spirit or in flesh, Rohan was clearly a little mad. But I had to admit, I understood how he felt. But I was less concerned with how incredible these events were than how they'd come to pass at all. Who knows? When Morio suddenly started moving, perhaps they all assumed Buddha was punishing us and gathered here in a panic? Perhaps there's some strange Buddhist sect I'm completely unaware of. No. No kind of Buddhism teaches group suicide or self-immolation, I said, struggling to stay on my feet. If I let my guard down for a second, I'd fall on one of the corpses. What happened here must have been some sort of mass hysteria. Anxious people, gathered in a room, the door locked. Rohan and I looked at each other, the same idea in both our minds. There was another locked room nearby, with even more anxious people gathered in it. We turned as one, and ran out of the temple. I don't know how you could stand it in there, Muriel Taisu said, wiping vomit off his chin. Summon Grand Blue! We have to get to the gym! Rohan cried. The urgency in his tone was such that Muriel Taisu didn't question it. In a flash, the three dolphins hovered in front of us, and we sped off so fast we nearly left Hirose and Fukushigi behind. If you want everyone in town to survive, hurry! Don't worry about being seen! Get us to the gym as fast as possible! Murio Taisu roared, and the dolphins sped up, no longer bounding across the ground, rocketing towards the school. We reached the school grounds in a few dozen seconds, crossed the sea of cars parked outside, and reached the gym to find a few thousand people pouring gasoline on each other. They, they were all muttering under their breath. No one was giving directions. They glanced in our direction, but saw nothing, even though we must have appeared to be hovering in midair. Listen close, listening closer... I could make out what they were saying. Scared, 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 scared. I shivered. Instinctively, I knew I couldn't afford to listen to them for long. We began shouting, trying to drown out the muttering. Nobody heard. It was as if they were possessed. Nothing we did stopped them from preparing for suicide. Rohan was yelling Heaven's Door over and over, turning them into books but getting nowhere. Damn it! All their books are filled with the word scared. There's no white space left for me, for me to write any orders. What now, detective? What could I do? Alter the conditions. Scared people gathered in a locked room, preparing to set themselves on fire. It was hard to make them stop being scared, but we could break the locked room. Can we destroy the gym? The dolphins and I can break windows, Muriel Taisu said as if it was a bad idea. He went ahead and started doing just that. The sound of shattering glass filled the air, but broken windows weren't enough, and the townspeople kept pouring gasoline on each other. Fukushigi and NYPD Blue were helping break windows, but it was taking too much time. They were about to start the fire. Leave it to me, Hirol said. I turned to find him on the ground, with blue thunder spinning up. A moment later he was at the ceiling. Watch out for falling rubble! It's better than burning to death, right? He yelled, and the size of his stand's propellers abruptly increased until they filled the entire gym. Then they started spinning faster. His stand was no longer helicopter blades. It had become a giant shredder. It tore apart the walls, and the ceiling fell, but as it passed through the blades it was torn to tiny pieces. He also had both hands held out, with more propellers on them, blowing the fragments to each side of him, sending them hurtling out the windows the Nijimuras had broken. It was over in no time. I looked around, and some of the people were looking at us. Not all of them yet, though. With the walls this high, it was still almost a locked room. Heroes! I called. Get the walls! As low as you can! Okay! Heroes said, and shot me a thumbs up, then tilted his giant propeller slowly forward, quickly demolishing the front wall of the gym. The evening light streamed in, picking out the heavy dust in the air. Almost everyone turned to look. The locked room was gone. What? Gasoline? Oh, it stinks. This is bad. People had come to their senses at last. Everyone but Hirose ran their way through the crowds, calling out, For your own safety, 
Please step outside and wash off the gasoline. Their heads clear, people nodded, and began heading for the drink fountains, or the pool, or the shower rooms. Nobody panicked. There was no struggling or running. They weren't scared anymore. Just as I was about to relax, Rohan asked, Did you see anyone who might be Kira Yoshikage? I had completely forgotten about that. Unfortunately. Come on, detective. That's our main reason for being here. Stop gawking and think. Man, he could be kind of a dick sometimes, I thought. He kept talking. Not just think. Look. Take a good look at everything. Almost everyone in town is here. Think while you look. The question is, what are you looking for? What do you need to see? You know nothing about what you might look like. If you ask me, changing your face and fingerprints to become someone else isn't as easy as it sounds. Kira Yoshikage is 38. You can't just pick someone the same height. They'd have to be the same age and the same skin tone and build. Kira looked after himself, kept in shape, worked out a fair amount to keep thin. Could he easily take another's place without anyone's noticing? A wife or a lover would notice almost at once. And then there's the matter of his occupation. Kira worked quietly in the administrative department of an appliance company, an unobtrusive salaryman job, but he'd been there long enough to get promoted to chief clerk, so if his new identity was the same age, he would have a similar level of responsibility. Could you do a different job with different co-workers in a totally different position without anyone noticing? I imagine it would be quite a challenge. And then there's your home. If he had a wife and kids, he'd never be able to risk going home the evening he changed identities. His face may look right, but his voice is different, and he'd have no idea what his wife and kids' names were. And even more practically, he wouldn't remember what they talked about that morning. That would certainly arouse suspicion. But these problems are all ones a delicate, careful type of psychopath like Kira would have been well aware of, and taken care to avoid. Yet he used Sujiya's face-off to replace someone else, which means he must have believed this was someone he could easily replace. This logic seems sound. So, if you look at the whole thing backwards, you'll see how Kira got past all the problems I just mentioned. He had to have known his victim's body, work and family wouldn't pose a threat. Those are the three things that would be hardest to deal with. To get past the problem of family, you'd need someone single, unmarried, or at least separated, or working far from home. For work, you'd need someone in the same line of work, or unemployed, or you'd have to change jobs immediately after taking over. That leaves the physical end. And if he has no family or job to worry about, that hardly matters anymore. You see what I'm driving at? Probably. You mean... You can't tell what someone's job is, or what their social life is like, just by looking at them. Yes. So, the man Kira replaced was someone he knew. Someone he'd studied as a candidate to replace. But then how could he know he'd be able to find this person in time to avoid capture? It was pure coincidence he round up fighting Hiroz and the others at the tailors, right? Of course it was. He headed for Suji Aya's place. What line of work was she in? She could exchange people's body parts, remember? Her line of work was hardly legal. She wasn't a bad girl, but she walked a very thin line. But officially, she ran a beauty parlour. It was called Cinderella. So he'd have to grab someone he could replace on the way to the beauty parlour from the tailors, right? But Kira was a very careful man. He was. That lay at the root of his cursed luck. His intense focus forced fortune and coincidence onto his side. That's one way of looking at it. But if Kira knew what Tsujiya's power was... He would definitely have laid plans in case he needed to make use of it. I agree. Hmm. Yet he can never know when he might be in that sort of trouble. There's only one way I can see to eliminate coincidence as a factor. What would that be? M simple. Make sure this candidate was also at, always at Suji Aya's side. I see. Beauty parlors rarely have male employees, though, what with all the changing of clothes. But she did. He only helped her with a secret business, though. More of a gigolo, really. I've no taste for such gossip, so I never met the man. But Yamagishi said he was middle-aged, but not bad-looking. Yamagishi is Hirose's girlfriend. What happened to him? No idea, but he would have worked perfectly for Kira's needs. Gigolos have no real family and no real job. Stealing his body would have been no problem at all. We'd better start by investigating that man. Standing here watching people won't get us anywhere. I have no idea what that man looked like. Kuchikun! He yelled shrilly, stalking away. A tall man in a suit, despite the heat, came over to me. 
Thank you, thank you. I'm Shishimaru Denta, the mayor of Morio. That was a very close call, and you have my gratitude. He intoned hoarsely. His suit reeked of gasoline. Oh, it was nothing. I'm glad everyone's safe. I really have no idea what we were thinking. I didn't dump this on myself, you know. My own secretary poured it on me. Terrifying! My right hand tried to burn me to death. You poured gasoline on me, sir. I could say the same, said a thin man standing behind Shishimaru. He was soaked through as well. Either way, it's dangerous, so watch that, watch that off, I said. No telling what might set this place off. Of course, we've called the fire department. By the way, how is it you can fly? Eh? I can't fly, I said. Then again, I suppose they would have looked as if I was. Either way, I was better off not admitting it. You were hardly yourself. You must have imagined it. No, no, I'm sure of it. You came flying in and saved us all. Talking to this man was like having hot air blowing in your face, and I nearly forgotten I had a message for him from Funny Valentine. But I wasn't the one who'd been given the message. No, this was no time for cribbles. And there was one more thing I was forgetting. Meh. On our way here, we found a lot of people dead in Jozenji. I believe what almost happened here happened there. Good lord. Is that... Shishimaru stammered. His secretary tapped him on the shoulder. Kumoi's here. 